Hey guys, how's it going? So a couple of different things today. First off, we are in the orchard because I wanna talk through our apple trees and the cuddling moth damage that they have sustained. I'm going to pick through what we have here. We're gonna pick them all today. We'll harvest all the apples. Most of them will go to Bethany's pigs because they have some pretty severe damage. But if there are some that look okay, like I was looking, this one looks pretty good. We will save these and I intend on making some applesauce with these. After we're done here, I'm going to be making a couple of arrangements for our mantle for fall. And I am going to be making them primarily out of flowers that will last forever in a vase. Either they have a really long vase life or they are really suitable as dried flowers. I wanna focus on those types because I don't want to uh, swap the mantle out for fall. I want it to go through October and probably a good part of November because I am hosting Thanksgiving this year and I want it to still kind of look fall even though I will have started Christmas decorating by that point. Anyway, I need the flowers to last a while. First off, I'm really proud of this tree. I mean, it was my fault that it you know, sustained all the damage that it did from the coddling moths because I did not treat it like I should have. You know, we came out and we did our winter application of liquid copper and horticultural oil, which does take care of um, plant, a lot of plant diseases, especially like leaf curl and stuff in the peaches and nectarine. Um, but it doesn't really take care. I've not seen a dormant oil or the, even the horticultural oil that's labeled for coddling moths. Um, and maybe I'm just using the wrong stuff, but uh, it's more of an in-season spray that you have to use to control the coddling moth. Um, so what happens, are a little kind of brownish gray moth uh, that overwinter oftentimes in, you know, debris or maybe even underneath bark, things like that. And in the spring they hatch and start to grow and then the adults start laying, the female adults start laying eggs on developing fruit and leaves nearby. So like as this one was developing, she probably came and laid eggs either on the apple or right above it. And then when they hatched, those larvae came down and they started feeding on the apple. There are a couple of different types of entry points here. Um, there's like a, a they, what they call a sting, where the larva will go in just a little ways and die. And then there's like a deep, I don't know what they call it, but where they go deeper and they'll actually go feed on the seed cavity inside the apple. And oftentimes you'll see a bunch of frass, which I can find right here, see that? That's called frass, that stuff that they push out from behind them, because it's gotta go somewhere you know, the stuff that they don't eat anyway. And then after the larvae are done feeding, they will drop out of the apple or they will just go to a different site um, where they can spin a cocoon and there will be the, the pupae, is that what you call it? Before they hatch again. Sometimes there'll be a couple generations in a season. If it's early in the season, it takes about three weeks for them to, maybe a little shy of three weeks for them to hatch again and have the whole life cycle happen again. If it's later in the season, a lot of times they will overwinter and then hatch again the next spring. So there are a few different methods of control here. And one of the reasons, one of them, I mean, we do get really busy in the spring and things like that, especially when we just have two small trees, those little chores sometimes fall between the cracks. Uh, but also this year we were trying really hard not to spray anything out here and we didn't. We didn't spray anything in the cut flower garden in season with more of like a broad spectrum insecticide. We used pred predatory mites instead to control the threat po population out here. But in doing that and not spraying out here, the cuddling moths did take over. So in our area, what we typically do with apples is when about two thirds of the blooms have fallen off, they'll still have some blooms left on the tree, but two th thirds of the petals have fallen you start in with a fruit tree spray and you apply every two weeks until the end of July. And that will usually take care of any generations of coddling moths that will um, come at your tree. And you can, there are lots of different um, sprays labeled fruit tree spray. I think the one uh, from Bonide that I'm familiar with that's a um, organic spray is a cold pressed neem oil, I believe. And there are others out there. So there's a couple of different things that I'm gonna do a little bit more research this winter because I'm just not as familiar with them. So if you guys have some thoughts on it, I would love to know. But there is a type of clay, it's kaolin clay. I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but it's something that you can spray on the tree. It actually forms like a little white powder on everything. And that powder repels pests. It causes irritation and it's just an obstacle for them wanting to feed and or lay eggs and all of that business. It's also supposed to help with fungal spores and it creates a sun barrier, which is said to help improve your crop, crop size and productivity and all of that, which that's all good stuff. Uh, the only two things I don't love about it, now all of this is surface level knowledge because I just wanna spend some time pouring through all the options this winter before we need to think about this again, uh, is that it does create a white film on your entire tree. And that means two trees that are in the very front of our orchard will look like they're covered in white 
hard water damage, which is something we try to avoid at all costs on everything else in our garden. And, you know, I like our garden to be pretty. I'm, I like the garden for aesthetic purposes as well. I just do, so I don't know if I'm gonna love that. And also they say because it prevents bugs from coming to it, uh, because they don't like it, it can also prevent beneficials from coming to it as well, which in turn can make a red spider mite population boom, which is something that we normally deal with. Uh, and because it's just two trees, it probably wouldn't be that big of a deal. Um, but I don't know. So I'm just gonna have to think through that. The other thing we can do if we don't wanna spray the tree with the clay is we could put coddling moth traps in here, which you replace every eight weeks uh, through a good part of the season. And what they have is some type of a scent or an attractant pheromone that attracts the male coddling moth. And if you get after early enough, a lot of times you can trap a lot of the males before they even have a chance to mate. There are also things called maggot barriers, which are like little nylon socks that go over your fruit that expand as the fruit uh, grows, thus creating a barrier for the, the larva can't feed on them. There's also a type of virus that's very specific to a coddling moth that you can spray on the trees when the eggs are starting to hatch. Uh, it's not harmful to beneficial insects at all. And that really interests me. I'm gonna get with um, the company that we got the predatory mites from and ask them some questions about it. It's like CYD-X. I don't, I don't really know a ton, but it's an interesting method for sure. We've seen such good results with the predatory mite release. I mean, it's taken a little while and I think it's gonna take into next season as well, being diligent with that. But if we can get to kind of a, a situation where we're not spraying anything at all um, and just have this nice little ecosystem out here that would be amazing so anyway that's where we're at with the apple tree I'll have more information on that of course once I um figure out exactly what we're gonna do and maybe get some of your input and your opinions about this whole thing so for now I'm gonna put the most affected apples in one basket for the pigs and then I'll save some that I think we could salvage for applesauce in another basket so let's get these all harvested Job. You can go put it in that basket. Like eat it? No. I'll give you an apple to eat. These have some damage to them, babe. <gasps> Almost. And, oh, I missed you. You want to pick this one? That's, that's not right. Yeah. Woohoo! Uh oh. Watch, watch me. Okay. Okay. <gasps> Good job! I got it! High five! Yeah! Mom! 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 What? Mom! 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 This one can go in that basket. guys, not as bad as I thought it was going to be, to be completely honest with you. So this basket right here, minimal damage. There's a few, I think this one, yeah, it just barely has some, almost looks like surface level damage. We'll see when we get in there. Um, some of them have a little bit more like right there, but this whole half is really clean. So we'll just cut the affected part off. So I'm going to take these in right now and we're just going to make some quick cinnamon applesauce unsweetened um, that we'll just eat fresh. We won't can it because there's just really not that, not enough to can really. And then these right here that are looking pretty crummy, these will all go to Bethany's pigs and they will enjoy them. So what I do when I make applesauce, whether I'm canning it or I'm just gonna eat it fresh, is I cut my apples up into kind of uniform sized pieces. I toss them into a big pot with a tiny bit of apple cider. I've got some fresh pressed apple cider that Benny just dropped by yesterday just to add a tiny bit of moisture and then I just put in cinnamon to taste and I cook them down I use my immersion blender to just make it into a nice applesauce consistency and then I pack it up and put it in the fridge or put it in jars and I process it I'd have to look up the processing time because I can't remember off the top of my head but I use that recipe which is very basic and really very pure it's, it's so good uh, whether or not I'm canning or not so let's go do that and then we will think about the mantle. Oh my goodness.
All right, guys, it has been a few days. Time got away from me, but we do have a little bit of the applesauce left, just a little bit. We got a whole mixing bowl out of what we harvested the other day. The consistency is just perfect. And that little bit of cinnamon, oh, it's so tasty. We've been really enjoying it. It's definitely a more tedious process though because it takes a lot longer when you have to cut around all that damage. Plus, I take the extra step of going back through all my pieces to make sure I didn't miss anything. If you did miss something, um, it's not gonna hurt you at all. It just, that thought kind of grosses me out though. So I wanna make sure that whatever I'm cooking is clean. Hey, babe, how are you doing? I got a hat. I love your hat. Oh, you're gonna go play in the truck, awesome with an adult good <laughs> good <laughs> it's just nice to know that you have the ability to use your produce even if you know something like spraying your apple trees falls between the cracks and then we have this winter again to research and kind of decide what method we want to use next year to approach the problem knowing that it's definitely a problem so that is it about the apples now we can tackle our mantle arrangements which i'm excited for these are the vases we're going to use aren't they fancy we're gonna go maximalist with these arrangements, like big and abundant, lots of color. We're gonna be utilizing some really beautiful hydrangeas. These are the Blue Enchantress hydrangeas, which are starting to turn a little bit more pink, which they do uh, in our area. Usually the first season, like the season we get them, and these are in pots because I can't get them to live in the ground. Uh, they will be more blue and they were way more vibrant blue earlier in the season, but you can see they're starting to fade more pink but the color is so pretty on the, the uh, spent blooms. We've also got some gorgeous quick fire fab hydrangeas, some limelight prime hydrangeas that have beautiful color. But again, I wanna use all things that will either last a long time in a vase, like over a month <laughs> in a vase, or things that will dry beautifully. And it's gonna be hard to stick to that because the dahlias are still going strong. A lot of stuff still growing, going strong in the garden, the roses. But you know, if I did, an arrangement with those I'd have to swap them out in five to seven days and this is an arrangement I want to keep for a little while also those of you who have been watching our videos for a while know I have a love-hate relationship with our fireplace uh, the fireplace is in the side of the house that was built in the early 80s and you can tell you can definitely tell it's a three-sided fireplace though which I love it's very unique the big side faces our great room and then there's a little side that faces our kitchen another side that faces a uh, hallway I love the kitchen and the hallway sides all three of them have different kinds of masonry like one side the kitchen side's brick the hallway side is a gray stone but the great room side is this orange stone and the doors are great big they're iron they're heavy and they've got a lot of iron scroll work on it so it's been a little bit of an intimidating place for me to decorate because that side has the mantle is not what i would choose you know had i built the fireplace but it's all stuff that can be changed but i am thankful that we have it i love that we have the ability to heat the house if the power was out it's never happened before but you know you never know and it just is a good feeling i also love the sound the look and the feel of a wood fire i grew up in a house that we heated by the way of a wood fireplace so it just feels normal and it feels right and i love that so definitely love it more than i mean the aesthetic changes can be fixed later later on after we're done with all the garden projects it keeps that going down and down and down our list of priorities okay here's what we're gonna do i'm gonna go out and gather stuff i'm gonna make the arrangements right here on this table because it's closest to the fireplace i can make my mess out here uh yeah and i don't have to transport them as far so let's go out and get our stuff i'll give you a little tour of everything i end up with once we're back here and then we'll build
think we're ready to start building this arrangement. I prepped the first vase. Now I am gonna put a tiny bit of water at the bottom of the vase, just enough for the flowers to use up, but not enough to where there's going to be excess in there that will sit there and stagnate and then possibly smell after a few weeks. So I might put, you know, an inch or two in the bottom. And these blooms, they're alive enough still that they will soak up some of the water and that will help preserve, especially like the hydrangeas. Um, sometimes I'll make an arrangement just with these flowers and not use any water at all and they do great but this is the infrastructure here uh, we've got some chicken wire and this is like the wide chicken wire I do have an example of the smaller hole chicken wire right here so you can kind of well, maybe right there you can see the difference so there's the smaller hole versus the larger right here and so I just kind of make a sphere of the chicken wire look at my fingers from processing those flowers getting all the leaves removed off of them uh, but I put the sphere of chicken wire kind of wadded up and shoved down in the vase and then you can I'm going to put a different piece of tape I didn't cut this one quite long enough but this is just like floral tape I don't know, you can get it in the floral department like at Joann's or craft store uh, this helps keep the chicken wire in place so let's run through our goodies first of all aren't these the coolest things these are the Tennessee spinning gourds and it's like they're their own little garlands already just little cute gourds all along the stem Benjamin and I were out there we removed all the leaves so we were just left with the stems and the gourds of course we have the hydrangeas here I didn't cut those yet I'll cut those when I'm ready to use them but I did get some of the limelight prime and those have such beautiful color we've got echinacea seed heads right here I did remove some of the petals but I just picked some that had some nice orange color in them we've got some I think this is crystal palace celosia and then there's the sunday wine red celosia and those both dry nicely we've got yarrow right here and this is a blend like a summer pastels blend I think is what the name is a bunch of pretty color and those dry beautifully this is the Midnight Masquerade Penstemon stems. So these are already dry, but they bring a really interesting texture to an arrangement. We've got a few different colors of straw flower. Listen to that, so cool. We've got some apricot. We've got some kind of creamier colored ones here. Whoop, it's real pretty. Yeah, look at that, so pretty. Then of course this beautiful burgundy. These are pincushion flower seed heads right here. These are off the Falma series. They're a little bit more round. And then these are off of their pink. I can't remember the exact variety, but they're a little bit more long. We've got some Crespedia or drumstick flowers. We've got some Eryngium. This is Eryngium I cut today. There was a fresh stem out there, which was fun. This one is a little bit dried. And then these are stems I cut earlier this season uh, and they're already dry. I had them hanging in the studio. These little roses I've had hanging in the flower shed for a year. <laughs> They've just been chilling in there and they're real pretty. And then I got some status. I'm gonna have to take out, like this stuff is spent and I don't really wanna use that. But the apricot colored status is so pretty. I think that'll be really nice. So that is what we're working with today. I think it's gonna be a very autumn looking arrangement. And I think once we get the vases set up on the mantle, we'll maybe incorporate some candles, maybe, maybe not. Um, I already have two little lamps up there and then we'll get some pumpkins and squash from the barn that we've already harvested and we'll just make a big pile of them on there. Right, guys first arrangement is pretty much done I will probably fuss with it a little bit once I get it up on the mantle because you'll actually be looking at it from like this angle right here which is kind of fun because then you get to see the vase and I didn't cover it with too much stuff like I didn't drape a bunch of stuff out of it because I really wanted to elevate this so that we could put some pumpkins and squash around the bottom of it and the vase is really pretty itself so I did tuck in one of the gourd stems it actually originates there and twists around and kind of curls back in and then I tucked a couple of individual stems in so there's this little guy and this little guy right over here a couple of them popped off while I was in the process but that's okay we'll just work them into the arrangement down below it's just amazing to me though that making an arrangement with flowers that dry like this we can expect these arrangements to pretty much look like this 
they'll get a little bit less vibrant as you know dried flowers do but not much especially like the straw flowers the hydrangeas the echinacea the eryngiums already dry i mean the only ones that will get a little more dull will be the celosia and the yarrow but it should maintain pretty nicely now the trick is going to be trying to make a second one that looks pretty similar but mirror mirror image the nice part though is i think we gathered more than enough stuff for these arrangements so i will have leftovers i thought for sure i was gonna have to go back out and gather more things it's kind of nice to not have to do that and this just caught my eye i just wanted to show you how pretty the pincushion flower seed heads look in an arrangement like this there's another one right here right here they just bring such a fun touch to the arrangement and the only one i did not use were the crispedia Honestly, like I grow these every year because they're easy to grow, but they're such a uh, bright, commanding flower. I mean, you put that in there and what do you notice? You notice this one, hello, it's so bright. And I wanted this, like while I'm using a ton of color, I think that this would have made it be a, like a little bit too much. And I've got a lot of round going on. You know, we've got the echinacea, the scabiosa, the, the roses have kind of a round look to them, so do the gourds. I thought it might be just a little bit too much. So anyway. We'll use these in something else. You know what else would look cool? These anemones. These are spent flower. I mean, obviously the flowers are gone. Most of them, there's a flower left. These would look really cool in an arrangement. I don't think so, sir. Uh-uh. Nope, not today. Okay, let's go for arrangement number two and then we'll get them inside. guys we got these pretty dang close to matching and they're going to be far enough apart on the mantle i don't think you'll notice the differences okay ignore the mess behind them but oh my goodness oh it's really hard to get things to match when no two flowers are exactly the same but you know after i started making the second one i decided to pull the echinacea out of the first one because i think it was just fighting with the arrangement a little bit too much kind of like the uh, crespedia would have and I was liking kind of the softness of this one. So I pulled it out and I think it looks really pretty. So here's the second one. Got the gourd spilling out the side and it is a mirror image, kind of. <laughs> you know, I put the gourd swinging the same direction. I think that was the most important. And then like our centerpiece plants facing the same direction, especially the ones that really draw your eye. Having those in the same spot really helps make them appear like they're matching. So anyway, this is all that we were left with right here, a whole bunch of status um, right here. And there's all the Crispedia and Echinacea, a few of the pincushion flower seed heads and some straw flowers and some gourds, which we will use and the Orangium we will use. In fact, all of these things we will dry and be able to use later. And this is my junk pile, not too bad. A Little bit on the ground. Okay, let's take these in. I'm gonna shine up some pumpkins from the barn and we'll get this thing done. so pretty up there oh my gosh and the pumpkins and squash are nice too so this is the great room side of our fireplace it's big it's got a hearth right that's what that's called I think we actually use this as seating all the time so I think I would miss that if we didn't have it there so I think I'd still want that but I would love to take the rock off and these little curly cues off like I don't mind the shape of the door and the doors themselves but like the curly cues and these little doodads right there i don't i would probably not have those and i would love to have wood you know like wood molding and really pretty of course you'd have to have some kind of stone around it but something that's you know not in the orange family but it's gorgeous when it's lit and it's kind of funny because these things when it heats up they blow out heat but they start to whistle if like it's not drafting quite right so you have to come over here 
find one of these little things and find the hole that it's squealing out of. And sometimes it happens at two or three in the morning and I can hear it up in our bedroom and I have to come down here and get an oven mitt because these are piping hot and I have to find out the proper combination of holes to plug up in order to get rid of the sound. <laughs> It's one of those things that gives your house character. I love all of these though. We've got speckled hound squash right there. And then we've got autumn frost pumpkins, which is so pretty. These are midnight pumpkins. And then there's the Tennessee spinning gourd, just a repeat. Actually the ones that fell off while I was trying to work them into the flower arrangement. And then, boy, it's evading me the name of this one. I'll look it up and we can put it on the screen, but it's just like a flat cream colored tan pumpkin. I think these look really pretty with the colors that are in our arrangements. And kind of a repeat right there. That speckled hound has really nice color in it, a little bit brighter. And just so you can see the other side, this is the kitchen side of the fireplace right here. Brick, you can see the fire right through that glass. This one also blows heat out through these. You can close it off if you want. These don't make noise though. And this is kind of dark in here, but this is the dark hallway side, which is gray stone. Um, this also shoots out a bunch of heat. Boy, it's dark back here. But you can see through this glass into the great room there. This makes me really happy though because we are hosting Thanksgiving this year and I didn't want the whole house because you know we do a lot for Christmas. So I usually start decorating for Christmas earlier than Thanksgiving and I enjoy it. I think it's really fun. But since we're hosting Thanksgiving, I will probably have some Christmas stuff out, but I still wanted a lot of fall stuff out. So I wanted to make sure whatever we made for the mantle would still look good by then, which this will, so it's awesome. This is the kind of arrangement you make and it will last for the whole season. And while I was working on this, Benjamin was working on his flower arrangements. He gathered a bucket of flowers when we were out there as well. This one right here, Zinnia and some pretty dahlias. We've got this Cafe Olay twist right here all alone. He knows that that one can stand alone. He also put together this fall arrangement as a centerpiece. He really enjoys it. Here's the other one. There's a little grass seed head, really pretty variety. Got some warm tones in this one. And last but not least, this one right here. And you guys, that is gonna be it for today's project. I'm so happy with how the mantle turned out. I'm happy with the applesauce and the mantle. And the fact that the flowers are gonna last for weeks up there is awesome. Oh, we won't have to change it out until right after Thanksgiving, we'll do something for Christmas there. So now I need to go track down the kids because we are going on a nature scavenger hunt. I have a list of things that we're gonna go out and go on a walk and we're gonna find and check off a list. So it should be fun. Thank you guys so much for watching and we will see you in the next video. Bye.